Welcome to Constant Variables, a podcast where we take a non-technical look at building and growing digital products. I'm Tim Bornholt. Let's get nerdy. A quick note before jumping into this week's episode, we at the Jed Mahonis Group are looking to expand our team by bringing on some more iOS and Android developers. We at JMG place an emphasis on hiring for fit as opposed to skills. Skills are something that can be taught and fostered through mentorship and experience. Fit, on the other hand, is harder to define, but we've outlined some of the traits we're looking for on our careers page at jmg.mn slash careers. So whether you have a year of experience or 20 years of experience, I don't really care. If you're interested in talking with us, please reach out at careers at jmg.mn. We'll put that email address and a link to our careers page in our show notes as well. Today, we are chatting with Jazz Hampton, co-founder of the app TurnSignal, which has taken Minnesota by storm with its launch just a few weeks ago. So without further ado, here is my interview with Jazz Hampton. Jazz, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate appreciate your time and looking forward to chatting. Well, I, I appreciate your time because, I mean, you've been you've been on regional news, national news. I, I, I can't <laughs> like basically see any articles uh, anywhere printed without mentioning Turd Signal. But I, I got to ask, is this your first podcast episode? I think this is even my second or third podcast. So I Dang we it. are we we stay busy. However, uh, no, actually, this is my second. However, if this is if I'm the only feature, this is my first like exclusive one on one episode. I was just jumbled oh, yeah. in with a few people in one episode and I was thrown in the middle. I was lost. So th- there is a first here, nonetheless. Well, yeah, you were on, was it the 20 minutes uh, podcast? Yep, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We, yep. we sponsor that podcast. So I think it's, it's okay. We, we, uh, I'm, I'm fine yielding the, the award to the, to those guys <laughs> over there. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. So, so for the few of the people that haven't, you know, that are listening to this that I haven't heard, I, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and also Turn Signal and, and what you do there. Yes. So my name is Jazz Hampton. I'm born and raised here in the Twin Cities. I went to St. Thomas for undergrad and St. Thomas for law school. I've been a practicing attorney for the last uh, six years, but I left all of that to start a company with my two co-founders, unbelievable co-founders, Andre and, and Michael Creighton, or Andre Creighton and Michael Freelix, I should say. Um, and we started Turn Signal, and I'm the CEO and general counsel here at Turn Signal. And, and, and Turn Signal easily is, is explained as we're, we're a phone app that you have on, on any device, Android or, or iOS. And when you're pulled over, you simply press one button on the phone mounted on your dashboard, and it instantly begins recording. And uh, an attorney will appear in a video chat with you, uh, 24/7, 365, whenever you need them uh, during those roadside interactions. And our mission is simple: it's to uh, de-escalate roadside interactions with law enforcement. It's to protect your your civil rights, and, and third and most importantly, uh, to to make sure that drivers and police officers get home safe at the end of every day. How has the? Uh, I know you're you're uh, pretty new. Like we we just and full disclosure. I mean, we worked with you guys to get the the first version of your app off the ground. Um, but how has the release been? I mean, you've been in the app store for a couple months now. Is is, is everything going pretty smoothly from from your standpoint? Yeah, it's been 33 days, actually. I feel like I keep a counter <laughs> the whole time. And it's been really smooth. The, the user interface and, and the, the work done by JMG, you all, uh, has been really great for us. We, we really love what the users are able to see and the, and the interactions they have. And after being live for 33 or so days, it really has gained traction. And we're excited about it, actually. we After MSNBC, we had 5,000 downloads in in one, in one and a half days. Uh, which was absolutely incredible. Um, the the only negative there is that we we weren't in all of those jurisdictions. We're only live in Minnesota yet, and so a lot of them were you know California, New York, Florida, D.C., Washington. Uh, but we're really excited because I think that kind of it showed us that you know we need to get into all fifty states as as soon as is practical as soon as responsibly we can grow into those states. So we're looking forward to doing that. I, I like the the way you phrase that responsibly growing because I, I would imagine that you got quite a bit of uh, people on social media aren't afraid to uh, to call a spade a spade if if they can't use your app or something. I'm sure you heard some yep. some nice choice words from those people, but uh, <laughs> the the way that you phrase it of being like responsibly moving into markets is there a reason you started just in one small market and instead of just trying to launch nationally all at once? 
Yeah, you know, I'm like I said, I've been practicing law for the last six years, and my two co-founders were in corporate America as well. And so this is the first time we've been entrepreneurs. Um, but what we do know as founders is that we don't want to have a poor representation of our product out there in any way, shape, or form. And one of the favorite phrases I'm going to butcher it that I've heard recently is, uh, "If if you were proud of of your your first product, then you did something wrong, right?" So on the <laughs> flip side of that, like. There has to be, you know, everything won't be perfect when you launch, but you have to be responsible about it, especially when we're talking about giving legal advice to people who are in, you know, or legal guidance, I should say, giving it to people who are in one of the most stressful moments of their life. Uh, we, we have to be responsible about, about taking on that, that ownership of that interaction. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to doing it. And if we aren't ready to be in a jurisdiction, if we don't feel like there's enough attorneys to answer, we just can't be there. Um, but we know that, you know, we have a, a lofty goal of getting into the 10 more states before the end of December. So, uh, we're excited about the, the rate at which we believe we can grow. I would imagine too, the lessons you learned just being in Minnesota, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons really to every state, but I'm sure that once you can kind of get a strategy down for recruiting attorneys, as well as if there's any specific state level legislation that needs to be accounted for with the product in one way or another, um, you know, you, you can kind of have some time to iron all those lessons out in, in one state and then build a model to spread out to other states as time goes on. Yeah, that's exactly correct. You're correct. We so we we know what it takes here in Minnesota now, right? We know the infrastructure we have to set up. We know the amount of attorneys that we feel comfortable launching. We know kind of what the call numbers can will will pan out to be. Um, and at that point, you're just you're just replicating. And there's always going to be tweaks. You know, Wisconsin law is always a little different than Minnesota, than DC, than Texas, right? Uh, so there's going to be tweaks and changes. But at the end of the day. Um, the, the app is built in a way that we can just turn on a light switch in those jurisdictions once we have the attorneys there. But it's really great to have uh, Minnesota be, you know, we're all from here. Minnesota is the epicenter of, you know, a social movement here in the last year and change. Uh, so we're proud to start it here and then and grow to the rest of the country and uh, <laughs> recently request to grow beyond the borders of, of this country. So exciting stuff. I think a lot of times, you know, we, we get approached with app ideas and it's hard for me as a an app developer to kind of understand the market. And it takes a little bit of digging before I can get. And this is like, you know, if you're talking about like some highly complex business problem in some, you know, manufacturing industry or something, you know, like that, where it takes some time for me to wrap my head around. But this product, like the second that I saw that that's so, like Jazz and I grew up in the same city. We, we both went to Richfield uh, for, yep. for at least, you know, part of it. Uh <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm the trader no, that went to private school. <laughs> yeah, no, no shade, but uh, a little bit, I guess. Um, the, <laughs> but it, it, as soon as I saw you, you share that you were working on this product. It was just like it could not be any more of a of a clear idea, clear market, clear need. Like I, I just, do you have any insight or re, like any understanding as to why something like this doesn't already exist? Yeah, I, we we get that question a lot because in our investor conversations, I think the first thing investors think is, you know, any new idea is a dumb idea is often the thought. And there's not really people in this space with a, a, a real-time on-demand telelegal uh, service. The reason that I've really been able to, to distill it down to is twofold. Um, first, um, attorneys are the most archaic Old fashioned, never progressing professionals, group of professionals ever. Doctors progress in a way that, that attorneys don't. Uh, accountants change their ways and practices and automate things. Everyone does except for attorneys. It, I mean, the billable hour system has been in, in place for how many centuries, right? Um, but changing the model is, is something that doesn't happen. There's not much disruption in the attorney field. Um, and, and so, you know, not, in, not many attorneys are entrepreneurial in that sense. Um, so that's one barrier that you have to get over. The second is, you know, we talk about solutions or finding a, you know, instead of a problem, we now say opportunity, right? Finding an opportunity, uh, something to solve. Um, some of these opportunities aren't seen by all eyes equally, right? Um, and it's you, there were three black men in the city of Minneapolis and, and St. Paul. Uh, so we saw a need that maybe others didn't along with one of us being an attorney and an adjunct professor of law. And, you know, so the, the, the it was kind of the perfect storm of, of people and experiences. Andre being a, a finance expert with his MBA, Michael being a marketing and, and sales expert with his MBA. 
it took a, a kind of culmination of all of these things to say, hey, let's figure out a solution and then create it. Um, and, and I think that's why the, the publicity and the media and like conversations come naturally because exactly what you hit on. It's just like, a, why hasn't this been done yet? And we're excited to be the people to finally do it. I remember uh, in college, I took this class on people of color in the media and how like with like way back in the mm. day with like Ebony magazine, for example, how uh, yeah. before they launched, so many people were like, oh, there's no way that this is going to succeed. And and the, and the people that were saying <laughs> that, of course, were like 70 year old white dudes. And right, it's like, right. well, yeah, clearly you're not the audience for this. And I think a lot of times in you can see this represented in VC money and with investors is like the, the representation of people of color is is just so abysmal that uh, I I can imagine that there would be so many people that would just have this idea completely passed by because you know me myself if I get pulled over by a police officer I have different feelings than you you know like it, it's just that's mm. the way it is and so I wouldn't have even thought like it'd be really nice to have an attorney on board and and, and you know and and protecting me and and also protecting the police officer at the same time I it it just it, it baffles me like that uh it, when I when I saw, took that class in college and I. I realized like when, when she was explaining that of how uh, there's so much untapped market and so much untapped potential if you just listen to other people's problems and not just <laughs> worry about your own problems, you know? Uh, yeah. And the thing is, and and I think that kind of what you said is so true and then it kind of segues into the rest of our business model that is, listen, we we hear the need from people of color. Uh, and just like, and I'm by, by way of analogy, just like, you know, whether it's, you know, BET or hip hop music, where it was, it was made for it and targeted at a specific audience soon it grows and, and it grows to, to escape just the bounds of that audience. And we know turn signal is in the same, is in that same vein, right? Where we believe our early adopters will be people of color, but then we know soon after that, um, moms who are saying, Hey, I'm worried about my 17 year old kid, regardless of their race. Uh, when they're pulled over or when they're in an accident, because that's also another piece that we connect you with an attorney when you're in a car crash, right? And now you have someone looking your son, your 16-year-old daughter in the face saying, hey, I'm so sorry you've been in this accident. Let me help walk you through this interaction. Now we're talking about a user base that is growing so much more. I can't tell you how many parents that have talked to me and said, oh yeah, you know, my child isn't a, a person of color, but I want them to have this on their app because I want to make sure they're safe when they're driving. Um, so we know that there's a foothold and now we can say to the rest of the market outside of just the people of color, Hey, this is why we add value to you as well. You know, you mentioned earlier that you've got, uh, there's three co-founders in this business. And, uh, I know having a co-founder myself, sometimes the, the line and how you delineate responsibility and kind of share the stresses that come with, with a, a rocket ship startup can, can bring, um, how do you determine like splitting all those different responsibilities to make sure that the app gets built and the revenue models get calculated and the advertising happens? Like how, how do you balance all of those responsibilities? You know, I think because we have such, we have three really different sets of, of skills, uh, 85 to 95% of it really fall to different people really um, organically. So, you know, obviously the law stuff or anything having to do with lawyers falls upon my shoulders. Um, but but I can't do a P&L for the life of me, but Dre can, right? So all of these finance questions kind of fall to him. Uh, Michael with his expertise in sales, right? And we, I, I'm sure we'll touch on here in a little bit, kind of the B2B model that Turn Signal really is thriving upon. I don't have any sales experience, but Michael has been in sales for the last six years. Um, so that naturally falls to him. So we always, we, our text thread is called the Telelegal Avengers because we all are like different <laughs> people with different skill sets, right? Like I'm not putting on the Iron Man suit, that's Dre, right? So, um, so it, that 85, 90% of it falls in organically that way. And the rest, I mean, Michael and Dre have been best friends since they were four years old. I've been close with, with Michael since we were in, in undergrad at St. Thomas together. We operate as friends and we're like texting. We're always talking. It's like, yo, Mike, th like this is too much for me this week. Can you please just take this meeting? And he's happy to do it. And he's happy to take it, you know, and run with it, you know, all the ongoing communications or just, you know, pinch it for me that day. Um, and being able to be, you know, people that you really care about uh, and we, you know, if I have to go home because my wife needs me and, and Dre can cover, uh, it helps a lot. And I think I, I couldn't imagine running a business with people 
that frustrated me because it just it wouldn't be doable in the way that we have to do things, even for that minor fifteen to ten percent of the of the tasks that fall to us. I think that kinship really comes through like wh- whenever we deal with you guys and just seeing it uh, in, in your interactions together, whenever we talk with co-founders and, and with entrepreneurs and teams of, of founders, uh, you can tell early on whether they're going to be successful or not just by the way they interact with each other. And there's, there's teams that where it's like, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the Avengers, but it's kind of like if it was more like a uh, when you piece together an all star team for like yeah, football yeah. or baseball, like someone's, where it's like someone's not a role player. You got you got all stars on the court and it doesn't work. Too much ego and not any synergy between those tasks. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So I I, I appreciate yeah. that about about you guys. That that does make uh, makes things easier. Which if if you were an Avenger, which one would you be? Then because you said you're not putting on the Iron Man suit. So what's <laughs> which what suit are you putting on? Oh, that is like literally my favorite question I've ever been asked. Um, <laughs> and and honestly, it would have been Iron Man, but they would have been like, yeah, you have an ego for it. That makes sense. You want to be Tony Stark. So I'm I'm going to intentionally avoid that. And I will say that I am Doctor Strange. I, I, that's who I was going to pick for you too. I was thinking Doctor Strange just for, I don't know why, but that when you were mentioning the Avengers, I was like, yep, that makes sense. That's, and I guess it'd be because like, I don't know. I just, whenever something's like frustrating or like something's really hitting the fan and like, we're trying to figure something out and it's like, what are we going to do? I'm just like, I'm always like a quiet internal thinker. I, I think a lot before I talk because I don't want to say anything I regret. Um, and I feel like he's kind of got that vibe, you know, he's always just like moving those hands real slow and thinking about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just really yeah. glad that I'm in the host seat and I'm not going to give you an opportunity to try to punt that back on me because I have no idea what <laughs> answer I would give for, for being the Avenger. So, <laughs> oh my God, you, you're, uh, you're whoever Samuel L. Jackson is. That's who you are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That I'll, I'll take that. What's his name? Um, uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that at some point. Yeah. So I, I, I want to, I, w- I want to move back in time. So we're, we we obviously know you're in a good you know a good spot right now. Um, but th- this has been a, a, a an ongoing process for you to get to this point. So I I, I kind of want to go th- over some of the first things that you and Andre and Mike did when you started the business. So you know, talk about things like funding and product development, revenue model. Just like where where did you get started with like we've got this idea and then now what? Yeah, so a little bit more of that genesis. There's a there's a fourth co-founder who's kind of like our advisor. He's one of our consultants uh, now, and he kind of brought us together. He's uh, his name's Mike Nathan. He's a long background and kind of uh, in the entrepreneurial world. And he's he, so actually he's the Samuel that was like, you guys should all go and attack this problem. And I can <laughs> advise you on it. I've made that analogy before, actually. So um, he kind of points in the right direction. He's like, the first thing is is fundraising. And that, you know, for three people who have always had a salaried, stable job, that was a daunting thought and experience. Uh, I'm not a sales guy or uh, naturally, so I don't like asking people for money in any form. Um, and this sounds cliche, and I and I can appreciate that, but like, I don't feel like I'm selling something that needs to be sold. Like I like it, it just makes so much sense to me, and why you know people wouldn't want to get on board and stand with a company that's doing what we're doing. Um, I don't feel like I have to convince anyone. I just explain what we're doing and see if they want to be a part of it. Um, and and we really took that kind of view from the jump. And it's our fundraising has been, you know, we're blessed to to say that we we filled up a seed round quicker than we anticipated, uh, at a, it almost double the number that we thought we were going to raise at initially. Um, and and we're happy about that. But it was a grind. It was a lot of Zoom calls. It was Zoom fatigue. What what was occurring during that time, which I'm sure a lot of you know co or founders experience is, you're kind of building the bike as you're riding it, right? People are like, okay, so tell me about the business model, and you have a pretty good idea, and you have your pitch deck, and you have everything you're going to do, but it's still coming together. You're still learning more about what the product will be like in the environment, and you haven't even beta tested yet. Um, and so, developing the the product while we were fundraising was. Uh, pretty smooth, all in all. We we tweaked a few things. We did, we, you know, we're changing price points here and there. Uh, that was a, a lot of the changes that we were making. But uh, all in all, it was pretty smooth, and we're we're thankful to be able to raise money to to keep the doors open. Um, I will say the last point on that: raising money while running a business. Those are two entirely separate jobs. You know, if you are at a nonprofit, there's one people, there's a group of people who are doing the work, and there's a group of people who are fundraising. So to do all of it at once is like a lot. Um, 
and so all the power and kudos in the world to people who are running startups by themselves, because without Michael and Dre, there's no way that we could have gotten that done collectively, individually without each other. I'd, I'd believe that. <laughs> and, I, it, and, it, and I do like what you said about just going out and fundraising and it feeling natural in, in a certain sense, because I, I, it, that that's how I feel that that's why a lot of the companies that we take equity positions into, it's just like. It, it almost is a no brainer, you know, there's when, when you have to sit and explain it and really build a picture and a case and you're fighting for it and it's a struggle. It's like, it, it, it seems like something is off if, if it, if it takes that much work. And so it's not to say, like you said, you know, it's the zoom fatigue is real. You still have to have the conversations and beat back the, the rejections and, and, and fight for it. But at, at the end of the day, uh, I, 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 I can see it being a lot easier when you actually have that kind of heart and motivation to, you know, get the product out the door you that that comes across more than just whatever the metrics and things you come up with in your deck yeah and i think that speaks a little bit to you know and terms are nebulous but the term social enterprise right how many startups are there that are just really good business model of things that need to get done right there's businesses that need to get people from a to b like uber um but it's but when you hear about uber it doesn't like warm your heart or give you relief <laughs> about, you know, a, a larger issue that's being resolved, right? I guess drinking and driving, that is very true. But you get you get what I'm saying. It's it, This is solving a real need that everyone is seeing, like, on a very personal level, especially over the course of the last year. And so it's a business plus solving a real issue. Um, that gets you over the edge a lot, I feel like. So, you know, if there's anyone thinking about starting a, a business that can really, the phrase we use is do, do good by doing well. Um, I think that makes all the difference in the world too. One thing to, that I wanted to make sure we touched on too was just the initial revenue models for the app because I think that's one thing I'm struggling with with a, a few of our clients right now is, and I think every startup struggles with how do you fund and, and how do you like you know generate money from this product? Like, do you do subscriptions or in-app purchases or mm-hmm. do you have a uh, every time you activate it, it charges you ten bucks? You know, like it, how how did you how did you go through the process of evaluating the possibilities and then ultimately selecting one. Yeah, you know, uh, we we thought about how B two B, you know, our cost of acquiring a customer that just is driving down the street and hears a radio ad and wants to download it for themselves or their friend or their son or daughter. Um, that's that customer acquisition cost is about five times that of a business that'll come in and say, "Hey, I'm going to provide this as a benefit to all of our employees, um, part of our DNI strategy, part of our employee wellness strategy, whatever pillar you want to put it in." Um, that customer acquisition cost can really drop. So we knew that that could push uh, down our overall cost uh, if we were able to capture them. But so everything kind of revolved around making sure that we can have a B2B structure that can still stand up. Um, So we thought about the free model, but, you know, it's hard to charge a business for something um, that is free to the public. Uh, So so that's not really an option. We thought about the token, right, where you have the app on your phone and then every time you initiate it, uh, you know, it charges you $25 at a higher price point. Right. But now, you know, there's t- people don't even want to call their insurance when they're hit by a car. They're like, no, I'll pay out of pocket. I, I don't want to have anyone running that risk or that value proposition in their head when they're pulled over. I don't want it to be a, 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 a concern at that time. Like, Oh, I don't, I'm sure I'm fine. I'm not going to, you know, initiate a token. Uh, so that kind of drew us back on that one too. Uh, and we didn't, you know, and people, we view it more like insurance, just keep paying it. And then whenever it happens, use it and you already paid for it. That makes sense. And and it it is, it does go to show like, it's not just a lot of times people, I think, believe that this part of the process is easy of, of how you actually generate it. And, and, and when you, cause I, I think a lot of times, you know, for, for, uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, they think that the answer to providing an app is, well, just throw some ads in it. And, uh, mm. and, and it's, I, I think there's things like that where it's like, well, just do X and it's like, okay, well, you know, X works really well for, you know, games or for this specific type of app, but for your app, like what do your users think? What, and, and that's what I really appreciated about you explaining that thought process was you being pulled over and being in a car accident are probably two of the most stressful experiences Mm -hmm. that like you can ever have in your life. And that was, I know when we were like kind of working through the user interface of the app, like you, when you, when you're in that like fight or flight, stressed out, 
mode, you don't get to have the full capacity of your brain to sit and think and analyze. And, and you can't be Dr. Strange in that situation, right? So I think <laughs> yes. it's it's like the, the simpler you can make it and not have to have like uh, any additional variables to the calculus that you're trying to do in your head. It's just like, oh yeah, turn signal, bam. Like that's all it should be is, you know, I, I've been like, you know, Siri, I've been pulled over and just then it launches the app and you're good to go. Like that's, that's all it needs to be. And you don't have to, you know, put any additional thought into it. And so I, I'm glad that, that you explained that that's how you were thinking through is putting it yourself in the mind of the user using the app instead of just kind of willy nilly throwing something out there. Yeah, I mean, and down to even the actual price. So and for anyone listening that isn't familiar, turn signal is, is $9.99 a, a month or $75 for a year. Alternatively, you can hit a button below that says, I don't think I can afford it and just answer eight questions. And if you're within the threshold, we let you on for free. Uh, we don't want anyone who doesn't have money in a position where they aren't going to be able to feel safe when they're driving. So we let those folks on for free. We don't even take your credit card information. Um, but even getting to that price point was a, a, a battle, um, a mental <laughs> battle with us sitting in this conference room, like like I running the numbers, right? Um, and we actually, it got to the point where we hired an expert in it. We spent some of our early value cash on on having a professional survey organization go out and find out what the price point is that would make people feel comfortable um, paying for it. And we learned a lot from it. One of the things we learned is if we price too low, people would think these aren't even real attorneys or they're the worst kind of attorneys or the lowest quality attorneys. So there's even a value proposition that is added to how much we're charging. Um, if, if you really sell a cheap product, people think it's going to be cheap. That's really interesting that you said you use some of your, your, your seed money to bring in outside help. I, I think sometimes it's hard to know in a startup sense, when is the right time to, you know, ask for help, go to your advisors and get, you know, quote unquote free help and, and when to mm -hmm. pay someone to, to bring in to do that. And when to just sit, you know, it's a startup. So you have to, you're the janitor and the CEO, you kind of have to do everything <laughs> uh, at, at certain times. So how do you make that? Like, how did you make that determination in this specific case, I guess, of like bringing in somebody else to kind of mediate and help advise the, how you select a revenue model. Yeah, I think a lot of those choices as we sit and again, it's nice to have three people in a room so we can really talk out loud and, and maybe think of ideas others didn't. But a lot of it is, is I think about, you know, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but um, unfixable damage and going out into a market and pricing at, at $199 when you found out that's too low and it should have been $12.99, you can't make the jump then. Right, like I can't be a product that's one ninety nine that goes up to twelve ninety nine without adding significant, you know, enterprise value or changing the service. Right, I only I mean, hell, people get pissed when when Netflix goes up a dollar, <laughs> right? You know, and <laughs> and we all spend twenty hours a day on Netflix, at least in my house. Um, so so if it's going to do irreparable damage on some level, I don't want to guess at it. Um, and and if I make a choice and it's based on statistics and, and information and, and expertise and it's wrong, then I did everything possible to, to make the right choice and, and it just didn't work out. Uh, but you know, uh, what is the, I think it's Zig Ziglar is a quote that's like, uh, if you, if you don't know what you're aiming at, you'll hit it every time. Like if you, you know, if you, if you like, I can't just shoot in the dark and hope I'm right. Um, cause I won't be. No, that's, that's, I, I love that. So we've, we've been talking about how you kind of have a, a direct, you know, B2C play of going from yourself to individuals who, again, you can go right now and download it from the app store or Google play. Uh, but I know that you're working on bringing this to businesses and making more of a B2B play so that it's a uh, benefit to the different organizations, to their employees. Uh, talk about that initiative and, and just, you know, where it came from and what the interest level in it has been so far. Yeah, so the interest level in it has been really high. Um, in fact, we've had, I, I'll just say, like we've had Fortune 5 companies, we've had Target, an SVP from Target, went to our website and filled out the contact us form to reach out to us <laughs> to learn more about the program. Like, Who does it, that? It's, it, right. It's, and I was like, I was like, you guys, I think we're getting fished. <laughs> um, but it's, and he's, he's a really great guy. And he, and it, again, I think that just speaks to, and, and, you know, when I was at my law firm, I was also the director of diversity and inclusion, you know, over 150 attorneys, 300 employees, 15 states. Um, and I know what the DNI strategy was, right? It's to, to diversify your employee base. It's to retain your employees, diverse and, and their counterparts, and then to do community outreach that's really valuable to the diverse communities that need it the most. 
Um, what and so what I do, and this is not a joke. I, I, we meet with a HR, the SVP of HR, senior leadership, the president, whoever it is, and I pull up their Instagram feed, and I go to that Blackout Tuesday from last winter or last summer. I'm sorry, June second usually is the date. Um, and I pull up the, the, what they posted on Instagram, and I read it to them. Hey, uh, X company is, is truly disturbed by what we've seen uh, happening to the Black community. We're here for them, and we want we, them to know we're listening, and we're, we're a voice that's going to use our platform to to be a part of the solution. I read that to that senior leadership person. And then I say, okay, um, Turnstone was here in this room offering you an opportunity to fulfill exactly what you're, what you're proposing. I want you to provide turn signal to every member of your, your, your company. So they feel safe driving to and from work or their kids to have basketball to remember the weekend. I want you to, when people click, I don't afford it. I want you to say, Hey, these memberships are sponsored by JMG. Uh, all members of, of of this community are getting it for free because of this organization, right? There's your community outreach portion. Um, again, just like when I'm talking to investors, I don't, I'm not selling anything. I'm, I'm offering you an opportunity to fulfill what you want to do already um, in a clear way that is actual, a tangible solution, not just, you know, a, a diversity training day with a, a outside consultant. It's just ridiculous how good you are at this. Like you should, you should be doing this for a, for a living, you know? Um, yeah, that, it, I it's, it, it, I, 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 it isn't, and it isn't even kind of like you can, you can be kind of flippant about it and say you're throwing their words back in their face, but it is, it, it's, it's funny just that, uh, there's, there is so much talk and so much just social media posturing about what you can do to help. And I, 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 I don't think if you look back at JMG's social media that we've made any posts around any of those things because I, it, 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 it's not, and again, it's not because I don't believe in those initiatives. I, I do like that's, that's one reason we wanted to work with you. And, and one reason right. that we want to like bring you on and promote you is it's like, I'm tired of hearing like just flipping through social media and seeing all these grandiose posts about like, not even just like people of color, but like the LGBT community, just all the other, yep. uh, just different communities that are underserved and underappreciated appreciate it. And it's like, just, yeah, put your money where your mouth is and actually do something instead of just like saying you're going to do something. And then a year goes by and it's like, well, what, what have you done? Yeah. And that's the thing. And, and I like that you said it like, um, because I'm not, if you make these posts, I'm taking them as very genuine. Like I'm not, I, I assume I'm at to a fault. I assume the best in people. And so when you post that, I assume you really want to do that. And so I'm like the other analogy I always use, is like, if someone's on Facebook and they're like, damn, I'm hungry right now. And then I knock on your door with a fresh pizza. Like you're hungry, right? Like here it is. I assume you were serious and they are right. And so, so take it, right? So I'm just providing a solution to what you openly said you want to, to work towards. Um, and, and it just makes sense. And there's, and I was in that position, right? I was the director of diversity and inclusion, looking for ways to be a part of the solution. Um, and one that works with law enforcement, right? It's not an adversarial solution either. Um, when Chief Blair Anderson talks about how much he thinks this can be a real, a real positive for the community, ooh, ooh, who's losing? No one. It's it's a win all around. Right. I've I've had interesting conversations with a lot of different people in my my personal circle about Turn Signal because I, I everybody has people on all sides of the political spectrum and whatnot. But in in my case, my grandpa was actually killed in the line of duty as a police officer, and mm -hmm. I. I I know very, very well, like that side of the story, just from growing up, like that was my growing up right. uh, experience. And it's been, it's taken an embarrassingly a long amount of time to learn empathy and actually like put myself in somebody else's shoes. But it's like, there's always two sides to every, every coin. And I, I, I think it's like, it's not just about the, uh, like getting people home safe that are driving. It's also about the officers too, of like, how can we hold, hold some accountability? Like if, if you're doing your yeah. job, right. And you're doing a great job, you should be rewarded and commended for that. And, and that's what the police are supposed to do at the end of the day is actually protect people and get people home safe. Everybody, not just the driver, but also yourself as the officer. For sure. And, and that's the other thing. And, and, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up the point about, you know, your family and law enforcement. That's the other thing I always talk about or try to and when I'm having these communications. My older brother, my best friend, is a, a conservative Republican that graduated from Alexandria Technical Law Enforcement Academy, right? Like, like and he's my best friend, <laughs> right? And, and, and so, I mean, I talk to him every day, well, no matter what. I talk to him like three times a day. He never stops FaceTiming me. But I, I talk to him every day 
about what we're doing at Turn Signal, say, hey, what do you think about this? What would you think of this? How would you interpret this? Am I being disparaging to police officers when I say this? Um, because, and the phrase that I've been using around here is just because something is true or I believe it to be true, doesn't mean I need to say it. Right. And, and so there's a lot of words that are charged nowadays that are, that, that could divide people further and and prevent listening. And so if you can avoid those and still get the same message across, I think it's imperative to try to work towards doing that. If it's going to help get a solution into the hands of, you know, everyone to save lives. And it goes back to something we preach a lot on this podcast and just when we build apps in general is it always comes back to the user, right? And and one way or another, when you're talking about an app like this, it's clearly the user is the person that's tapping the button and and being there. But then there's also the attorney is another user and another voice in this equation. And then law enforcement yeah. is a third voice in this equation. And like that, the worst thing that could happen for turn signal is that there was this big adversarial uh you know, issue with law enforcement where if you put a uh, a turn signal sticker on the back of your car, you might as well be like putting like a you know, like a middle <laughs> finger to the cops or something on it, yeah. and you're just going to target yourself yeah. even more. Like, and 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 worse comes to worse. Like, if they if if an officer, I, I mean, even not not worse comes to worse, but just in general, if an officer doesn't understand what turn signal is, like if you don't in, 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 get into their community as well and, and educate them on what it is, then they could feel you know certain ways when the camera is pointed on them and you say this conversation is being recorded and here's my attorney and all that stuff like you're just kind of setting yourself up a, a little bit for some failure so it's it's good that you're going out and actually engaging with the law enforcement community because they are they they have just as much of a voice that needs to be a, as part of this equation i would i would think yeah 100 percent. and because the thing is not only do i want them to return home safely obviously because i want everyone to but if a police officer feels more calm as they approach the car, guess what? That interaction is going better. When I come home and I'm pissed from whatever happened at work or, or anywhere else, like my interactions with my wife are, are not as good because I'm, I'm in a bad mood, right? Or I'm nervous or I'm scared. Whatever the feeling is that a police officer might have, if they're nervous or scared as they approach the car. Now, if I take that away because, oh, there's a recording of this and uh, there's an attorney on the phone. So this person isn't going to do something erratic or something that I have to like fear, like I would normally, the interaction is going to be better. Right. And so I don't know. I just, I I'm yet to find even along, like we've interviewed nearly 20 police officers or nearly are approaching already 20. And every, every one of them is like, Hey, great. You mean they'll have a recording and they'll know that I always follow the rules and I'm not doing anything wrong. Great. That means there's an attorney on the phone who, if I really do have a right to search their car, now the driver isn't going to be screaming, I didn't consent, you can't do this. The the lawyer will actually say something along the lines of, actually, that is sufficient probable cause and you have to let them through your car. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it on the back end when we are in court. Great. <laughs> right? So it's a win-win. Yeah, no doubt. So. We, you often talk about Dante Wright being killed during the product development of Turn Signal, and, and and if the app had been developed sooner, maybe he and frankly, you know, countless others would still be alive today. Uh, facing some of these societal pressures of getting your product to market as soon as possible, I, I know we kind of took a very complex app <laughs> and shrunk it into like three months of development. Uh, w- which uh, I'm not going to pat my myself and my team on on our back, but man, that that well, was you a uh, <laughs> you don't have to. We <laughs> will. will. You did a great job. <laughs> it, it was it was a Herculean effort, but we we did it, and that's that's the important thing. Is now it is out there and it is helping. Uh, but let's let's move in a different different world where maybe you had had a little more time to go through the development process. What might you have done differently? And, and, and another side question is what features did you push later because of these time constraints of wanting to get this out the door as quick as we could? Um, I love that, that question. I think the first thing, and oh God, maybe this is a wish list and not a, a do over list. Cause even if I could do it over, I don't know if I would have changed this, but we now have, uh, uh, archetype or architecture kind of uh, overall tech lead in-house that can help steer conversations and direction better than we could right we didn't ha- we didn't develop swim lanes for for our developers you all to review we didn't do a lot of higher level things that would have made you know version 2.0 and 3.0 easier to do um so i think but i mean i didn't have the money then either so that's why i say if i went back i don't think i could redo it necessarily 
uh, but a little more front end work from um, in that sense would have been better. Um, and things that we didn't put in that we could use now, uh, you know, are all things that I think would help spread the word. I think the product does what it should do today, right? But you know, could I have added something that says, you know, if you download this and, and subscribe, you can send it to two friends for free, right? These are marketing things that would have helped a little bit. Uh, to at the beginning here to get off the ground and maybe save us money on the long run. Um, and there's other, you know, functionality that we want to put in. Um, but honestly, a lot of it is dependent on lawyers and some of the work we have to do internally. So uh, I feel like our, our opportunities there are, are a little smaller now. So um, overall, I think, you know, especially with the truncated timeline, I'm super happy with it. And uh, just that, oh, the last thing I would say is, uh, our admin portal. Um, our, we made we wanted to make it as as quickly as possible to for the users and to have their experience be good, uh, but we didn't um, we didn't have all the time in the world to make our experience as good as possible. So I would have been able to build that out a little more if we had a little more time. But at the end of the day, you know, I never know how many. You know, I, this isn't like a water fountain where it has how many bottles you of water you've saved using it. Uh, but I have to believe, you know, in the years to come, I, I'll, I'll sleep good at night knowing that some lives were saved because of turn signal. Yeah, it, I think. Uh, um, crap, man, I totally lost my train of thought again. It's it's like hard being in a conversation with a friend of yours, like, and then you want to like say seven things, and then you just like your kid yeah. walks by and like wet. My daughter is like sitting outside the house. I can see her out the window, and there's a strawberry plant my wife has, and she's just like whacking yeah. it. And I'm just like, how, how can you focus like, when like something that hilarious is happening? Like, why are you hitting this plant? What is wrong with you? Oh my God. When I was working from home with the kids, I was like, this is never going to work because my son is trying to like electrocute himself over here playing with like a gum wrapper in the outlet. Like, how am I supposed to work? So I feel that. I feel that's my core. <laughs> How how have you been managing getting through the uh, the the pandemic with like dealing with family stuff? I mean, this is like a total one eighty from what the rest of this yeah. podcast is about. But you know, why not, let's just go with it. <laughs> yeah, no. So you know, my wife is also a full time worker. We have two kids, three and a half and one and a half, and then our third is due in twenty days. So we are like full on busy uh, and, and working from home. Uh, we ultimately were able to send them back to daycare, which was really helpful. Uh, but the thing is, and actually this does parlay super well into being a startup uh, with with my co-founders, we did the first two and a half or three months of this remotely. So, you know, you have a Zoom call and you're you're trying to communicate with, with what, you know, what your desires are, the, like, let's take the price point conversation. You know, you, that can't be had over emails. It was a it was a barn burner for a week in a conference room for two hours a day, right? And so when we were finally be when we were finally able to be back in person, it made all the difference in the world. And kind of our pace really picked up because I could just spin my chair around and say, "Hey, Dre, what do you think the projections are for you know July and, and August?" Um, where it's normally an email that you have to stop, and and it's just way more time consuming. So being in person, all vaccinated, has meant the world of difference to us as a startup during a pandemic. It's hard with, usually we communicate with all of our clients over phone and, and zoom and, and remotely. So we're used to that, but even still internally, you know, the, there was some hard times early on uh, where you do need that in-person collaboration. And I think that's just something that we're going to all have to work through together of figuring out what that right balance is of, I, I don't want to force anyone to go into an office five days a week. Like I, I think those days are uh, pretty much numbered, um, but mm -hmm. there's going to need to be, you know, that, that right balance for your organization of, is it one day a week? Is that enough of being in person? or two or three maybe even four like it it, it really just kind of depends on the uh, on the circumstances but it's i don't know it's it's nice to have that flexibility nowadays where you can choose to work from home if you want or choose to go into the office if you want yeah the flexibility is key and when, whether it's you know kids swim lessons or a doctor's appointment or whatever um the the fear of leaving the office now is kind of uh, put to the side a little bit which i appreciate so I know you have somewhat of a technical background with with like in computer science. Um, yep. Did any of that like come into play when developing? Like, how much of that experience did you directly draw on while you were building out an app based company? Oh, that's a great question. And 
Michael Freelix, my co-founder, is going to kill me because he's our CTO. <laughs> but it, and I don't think I've ever said this out loud, and so this might be when he hears this, it'll be the first time he's heard it. But like I have like experience in making swim lanes and uh, like oh, like our, like overall like you know planning and development. I was I was information systems, so like that kind of high level planning, I do have experience in. Um, and I and I didn't use it in the way that I could have in the development of this, mainly because you know my my knowledge and expertise in law took over, right? So I have to address all of the legal implications from hiring people uh, to to legal implications of having an attorney on the phone to contracts with folks that we're doing. So I had to focus in on that and not the technology as much. But what it did make a difference for was kind of my brain works in the swim lane world already right so when i'm picturing the the app i was picturing you know like the diagram with a diamond with an arrow coming out of it to the next screen um and eventually when it's into a new like uh, a new a whole new swim lane like a box and then drawing down to a new one that's how i pictured it on a high level and i think that helped us as we developed um conversations with you all compared to like someone who's just like i have an app idea and i want to do x y and z so it did frame our conversations a little better um, to, to have a better understanding and be able to communicate with you all better. Um, but I, I didn't go, go the full process of, you know, making the swim lanes and developing, uh, an overall story for that. But <laughs> Mike's going to kill me for that. I could have, but <laughs> had to spend time elsewhere. <laughs> Well, I mean, and that's, it, it, this is like the problem of being a polymath like yourself is if you have so many skills that you can bring to the table, like knowing and choosing which ones to bring to the table and when to delegate, like that's a, a skill in and of itself and a, and a task that most people aren't really great at. And, and, and I know I struggle with that sometimes too of, uh, it's taken me a long time to even, I'm still kind of uncomfortable with at JMG. I, I oh. rarely touch code anymore because that's, there, there's people out there that are better at it than me and i'm better at like this and strategy and, and yeah. different different things so I, I think it's it's interesting that uh it, yeah mike might might be a little upset for a little bit of it but i, I think he'd, <laughs> he'd get over it knowing that uh you know you you were doing what you needed to do in order to get the whole rest of the 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 system built up and and there's other people that are better suited to like you know use it when you can and delegate when you have to it's basically it Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, I, I, I think I love rap music because I love analogies and that's like all it is. But by way of analogy, it's like, you know, in high school football, there's a guy on our team who was like, he was the best wide receiver and he was the best linebacker. But if he did both, he wasn't the best at either. Right. And so if, if you have to focus in on one thing and maybe plug and play somewhere else, uh, sometimes that's necessary. So you can really, you know, actually fully dedicate yourself to something. Uh, and make sure you're doing it the right way. I'm sure it's it's it, it was relatively obvious in this point too. But I think uh, trying to figure out how you lay out these different paths you can take because you like like you laid out with the, with the football analogy, it's like you can pick to be a, a a linebacker, you can pick to be a running back. Both could lead to really great careers and great prospects going forward. But like, there's always this what if kind of mentality when you do that route of like you know mm-hmm. you go you choose to be a best linebacker or maybe you were like you know top three or something, then you're thinking, well, could I have been the best running back too? And you have this kind of regret yes. as to, to which path you should have taken. Is there, do you feel any of that at, at any time? Like when you're thinking of things with turn signal, cause since you do have such a breadth of areas, you could tap, like, are you happy with just sticking in the lane of being like chief legal officer and, and, and managing the legal side of it? Or are there times when you're like, oh man, I really could have like taken this tech thing and run with it. Yeah, I think sometimes even I have those feelings around the actual legal work. So I have the legal knowledge, but almost, and I'm, I feel like this is kind of similar to you. I love like, you know, the MSNBC stuff and, and explaining the product to people and, and explaining the value to other folks. Um, that's where I really think I thrive. And sometimes I think like, well, if I did more podcasts, if I did more interviews, if I did more meetings with business folks, could, would that be more successful for us as a company, right? Um, compared to even the legal work. So I do, <laughs> that's the one place I think about it sometimes. And Mike and Dre are like jazz and my wife are like jazz. You need to stop taking so many meetings, <laughs> but <laughs> it's hard for me to do it because I really, you know, I see myself as carrying value in that area. And I think I like to do that the best. So um, it's tough to give it up sometimes. And, and no one wants to see Mike on, uh, on MSNBC. So. <laughs> <laughs> no one, 
or Dre. Dre doesn't even want to see Dre on MSNBC. So, <laughs> I, full disclosure: I would love to see those interviews. By the way, I, I, that was that was a total joke because I would love to see either one of them on there. But that's okay. I think you definitely carried your weight on on that front. And and I and I will say that Dre and Mike are great about that because that's what um, they prefer as well. It wasn't like a rock paper scissors who's going to be the one that does that. Dre was like, no, I know these numbers. You go do it. And Mike was like, I do. I don't want to see my face up there either. So it's nice to, you know, come to a consensus and not have to be fighting over it. But again, that's kind of like that 85, 90% of, uh, you know, where, where we're going to fall in, in terms of roles it fell organically. So that's good. I love it. What, uh, wrapping up here, what advice do you have for other founders right now that are going out there and trying to get a, a product developed? Is, is, is there any kind of, this is, I, I always find this to be an obnoxious question, but I still think sometimes it can glean some good insights <laughs> because it's, yeah. it, if, if you were, you know, the whole, like, if you're starting over, just wh- what would you tell other people who were in your shoes where you were, you know, just a, a, a short while ago? You know, I think it's really important to, especially if you have something that has high interest like we did, if people are reaching out to you, document it, respond, follow up, and see where it goes, right? And uh, this is this is not a, this is a shameless plug, I should say, but you reached out to me about us and we had a developer already. And I was like, hey, like, I really appreciate you reaching out, Tim. We're, we're, we're working with someone right now. If anything changes, I'll let you know. And the developer that we had previously was just, you know, he was a friends and family guy who had his full business and he had uh, his plate full. Um, and, and we were asking more time than he had and he was giving more than he had. Um, so, so we had to pivot um, someone who could dedicate full time. And the first thing I thought of was, oh, you know what? I have a spreadsheet of folks that have reached out to me. And I know one of them was a developer from my, from, you know, my childhood. So let me reach out and see and see. Um, if that didn't happen, I wouldn't. We wouldn't be where we are. I don't think anyone could perform the level of work JMD did in the timeline they did, um, at the price they did. Uh, you all did, I, I guess I should say. So that's just one example. But I have a million of them of of investors who are like, "Hey, this sounds really interesting. Let me know if you you have time to meet. I'd like to talk about potential investment." Um, you know, protect your calendar and your time is one thing they that these two keep telling me. But you know, if if you have an opportunity to to follow up on those. Um, if people want to reach out and help hear them out, I think it's, it's really valuable. I heard a long time ago, somebody say like, when you're talking about people that, uh, people want to help. Like, I I think when you reach out to somebody and ask them for help, uh, people feel honored. Like it's, it's really Mm. like people want to feel that their skill set, the thing that they can bring to the table is something that can be used and useful. So I, I think that's, uh, it's a, I think that advice is so good because people really under uh, appreciate the value of their own internal networks. And I, I know a lot of times founders that, especially when they're young, when they're in their late twenties, you know, they, they don't have 30 years of corporate experience with all these interactions of kids, like at, at school mm-hmm. with, with like meeting parents at different events and whatever. It's like, you, even though you only have your small network, you still have a network and you can still reach out and find just one person that can help you you move to the next level and that person's going to know somebody really well that can help you further and that the the point you made of actually writing this stuff down <laughs> is is something yeah. i'm awful at but the the that's something i've learned too over time is like if you actually write stuff down and and routinely check it and <laughs> reference it just doing that you're going to be leagues above most people that run businesses <laughs> For sure. Because, and especially if they reach out first, it's like, you're not bothering them. If they didn't reply to your site, I just sent a follow-up email to someone that was like, Hey, you said you're interesting in connecting. Uh, and I haven't heard from you. Just wanted to touch base again and let you know how things are going. Just give an update, right? Hey, really exciting. We're bringing someone else on. I just want to keep you up to date. Let me know if you want to follow up on your previous email. And he replied instantly. was like, thanks for getting this back in my sites. I'm going to take care of this. Right. And sometimes people just need to check in. If they started the conversation, um, unless they're, you know, kind of jerks, then they want to finish it. <laughs> I love it. Jed, this has been like one of my favorite podcasts that I've ever done. This, this was so <laughs> Man, effortless. I appreciate and, and, that. <laughs> what, how can people find you, Turn Signal? If, if anybody wants to reach out and get in touch with you, how, how, how can people do that? Yes. Uh, so TurnSignal.com is the website and that's TurnSignal without the A. So T-U-R-N-S-I-G-N-L.com. Uh, turnsignal.com, you know, use the contact us form just like Target did, or you can just email me directly, uh, uh, at our, at our email address, which is 
info at turnsignal.com. Again, spelled the same way, uh, info at turnsignal.com. Awesome. Jazz, thanks again for joining me today. This was great. Nah, thanks for having me. I also thoroughly enjoyed it. Again, feel like I'm catching up with an old friend more than doing a podcast. So thanks for your time. A big thanks to Jazz Hampton for joining me on the podcast today. You can learn more about Turn Signal at turnsignal.com. And that's Turn Signal without the A in signal. Also, for the record, it's Nick Fury is the Samuel L. Jackson Avenger. I, I had to look it up after we chatted. <laughs> and I still don't know which Avenger I would be. Ugh. Show notes for this episode can be found at constantvariables.co. You can get in touch with us by emailing hello at constantvariables.co. I'm Tim Bornholt on Twitter, and the show is CV underscore podcast. Today's episode was produced by Jenny Karkowski and edited by the earnest Jordan Doust. If you loved this episode, even if you liked this episode, and you could spare a minute of your time, we would love it if you left a review on the Apple Podcast app. Just head to constantvariables.co slash review and we'll get you to the right place. This episode was brought to you by the Jed Mahonis Group. If you're looking for a technical team who can help make sense of mobile software development, give us a shout at jmg.mn.